Hi, my name is Uravar Kalra and I'm the founder of Massive Restaurants. We're a restaurant company whose main goal is to put Indian food on the global palate. Indian food has been something that's very close to me and my father's heart. My father, Mr. Jigs Kalra, was one of the stalwarts of the industry. He wrote some of the best books that exist. So I'm very proud to try and take his legacy forward. But the one thing that my father and I always shared was this deep love, sense of responsibility and passion towards Indian food. I, I think what drove me to get into the restaurant business to begin with was this sense of purpose, this sense of responsibility towards our great cuisine. It was considered very widely across the world as cheap takeaway or a place where you go uh, to a curry house in the UK. But that's not the way we wanted, or especially my father, he could not stand that perception of Indian food. He wanted to change it. He wanted to create recipes that were standardized. The biggest problem was our recipes were never standardized. They weren't documented. Chefs wanted to keep those recipes hidden. They didn't want to share them with the rest of the world because they wanted to remain important. They wanted those recipes to only stay within the family, which is not a good way if you want to propagate your cuisine. In my opinion, the best way to propagate your culture is through your food. I think it's the best representation of a culture. It's an amalgamation of, of centuries of data, of experiences, of, of family life, of, of all our entire, you know, it's a, basically it's a concentration of your culture into food. And that's the best way, in my opinion, to export your culture to the rest of the world. So let me talk about... Uh, the restaurant industry because I'm sure a lot of you that are watching this are uh, have either a cursory interest or a lot of interest in, in this particular field and let me tell you it is one of the most rewarding fields in the world but it's also one of the toughest um, to put things in perspective the restaurant industry or rather the business of eating out is the most popular form of entertainment for Indians to put a comparison it's 40 times larger than Bollywood that's the reason why great chefs like Sanjeev Kapoor and Vikas Khanna command the respect that they do. They are so popular. They walk down an airport or on the street and they get as much adulation as the movie stars, the Bollywood superstars. And that's because food is very close to Indians' hearts. We spend more on eating out than on any other form of entertainment. It's also a way to connect. It's a way to go with your, to, you know, celebrate life's key moments. It's a way to celebrate uh, friends, friendship, and just life in general. And I think that's the beauty of restaurants and uh, that's why I love being a part of it. Apart from being a lot of fun, it is also a big responsibility because people are depending upon you to um, take care of their life's special moments. And if you falter there, then in a way you're denting their, their uh, life's precious moments. So I think it's very important to have that sense of responsibility when you open the restaurant business, get in for the right reasons. It's also a very, very big industry, so to speak. Um, we're lucky now that the authorities have recognized the restaurant industry as an industry. It is uh, the second largest employer of humans in India after agriculture about 7.8 to 8 million people directly involved in the industry. That's a lot of people, second largest, like I said. It's also a big contributor to India's GDP. Uh, we have now, I think, the world's fourth or fifth largest uh, economy, and it's uh, $2.9 trillion, and we're 3% of that, nearly 3%, between 25 to 3%, which is a big, big chunk, a big, big contribution. So the restaurant industry by itself is important to the growth of this nation. It is also important for keeping us sane because it's the number one form of our of entertainment for us as Indians. The flip side is that the restaurant industry is perhaps the most high risk industry in the world. There's a failure rate of around 90% within the first year. So nine out of 10 restaurants will shut down within 12 months and 96% within 18 months. And the biggest reason is that the barriers to entry are low. So it's very easy to go ahead and open one restaurant. But it's a very complex business. There's a lot more that goes into it. It's not, it's not something that can function if you're trying to build uh, you know, an extension of your drawing room or if you're trying to get in it for glamour reasons. It's a very tough business. It requires systems, processes. There are a lot of gaps. There are a lot of holes that will need to be plugged. And it will consume you. It's not a nine to five kind of a job. It's not a nine to five kind of career. It's a lifestyle choice. So if you're trying to get into the restaurant business, literally write off your weekends forever because when everybody else is enjoying their weekends, they're going for holidays, you guys will be working and it'll be your busiest time. That being said, again, it is, I'm in it for a reason. And the reason is that I actually love it. So I think it's, I think if you get in it for the right reasons and if you're getting into it 
with a sense of purpose, with a sense of direction, with a sense of making a change, or most importantly, if you're really passionate about the kind of restaurant you're building or the kind of cuisine you're pursuing, then by all means, dive right in and you'll have great results. Uh, my, my father told me that if you ever want to choose a line of work that you want to pursue, first find something that you would do for free and then figure out a way to make money from it. Because if you don't like what you do, you will never be good at it. If you want to be a doctor and somebody's forcing you to be an engineer, you'll be a terrible engineer. If you want to be an astronaut and somebody's forcing you to be a race car driver, you'll lose every race. So I think it's very, very important to first figure out what is it that you really, really love from the core of your heart, something that you can see yourself do for the next 50 years and then pursue it, and then pursue it with full gusto, with full power. And I think that's the key. That's one of the key things my father taught me. And I can tell you very clearly that um, my life's experiences uh, have taught me that the key thing is to figure out at a very early age, perhaps even pre-teen years, in my case, around 11, 12, I knew I wanted to do restaurants. I wanted to pursue the globalization of Indian food, and that's what I've pursued since then. And maybe a part, a uh, small part of the reason why we've been able to achieve uh, some measure of success is because we love doing it every day. We wake up in the morning with something interesting to do. We wake up every morning with an extra spring in our step simply because we're pursuing something that we love to do. And the moment you guys are able to do that, you will excel, you will innovate, and you'll do all the things that make a business successful. So today I'm going to talk about three things in my life, three instances that relate to three specific facets of success. They're based around sustainability for the environment because that's very important. Without this earth, we're nothing. The second is innovation. And the third is a sense of responsibility, a responsibility towards your passion, towards your craft, towards the business that you're pursuing. And if you're able to involve these three things, you know, innovation, responsibility, and sustainability into your business, you have something that will last hopefully forever. The first one I would want to talk about is um, sustainability. We live in a, in a time where we're taking the earth for granted, we're taking the resources of the earth, which are very, very finite in nature, for granted. And that's, I think, the biggest mistake that we're making. Uh, we have to leave a planet in better shape than we got it. And our parents gave us the planet in a fairly decent shape, and their parents before them gave them the planet in an epic shape. Now, it's our job to at least not give them a really crappy planet that is devoid of resources and is, and is for the lack of a better word, just plain dying. So it's very important to have sustainability as part of your uh, career or your business or you know, your sense of responsibility. It's very important to have that as an important facet of your life going forward. So what I'm going to talk about now is um, uh, you know, a series of events that have happened, but one in particular. I think this was 1993. Um, I was in 10th standard, and my father used to, every year, take us for a gourmet trip around the world, somewhere around the world. He was a food journalist, and he used to go and study places, he used to go and study foods, and he used to get inspired and then obviously utilize that in building restaurants, in, building, in making cookbooks, and in working with the great chefs that he's worked with his whole life. And we went to Scotland and Wales on a, on a, you know, on a road trip. We, we reached uh, England, London. We took a car. Uh, uh, you know, I remember it was a really fancy Toyota. Well, fancy for that time. It was a very nice new rental car. My father was driving. It was me, my brother and me in the back seat and my mother in the front seat. And we went for a road trip across Scotland and Wales. We went and stayed at about eight to ten bed and breakfasts. Bed and breakfasts are small hotels that are run by families, really passionately run, maybe five to six rooms. That's their bread and butter. So people come, they stay, they get a family-like atmosphere, really good home-cooked food, and you enjoy your time, and then you, then you go. And I remember one specific one that really stood out for me. It was called the Penali Abbey, and it was in Scotland. And it was one of those uh, beautiful bed and breakfasts run by this loving family. And what this particular episode really brought out in me is this sense of, uh, you know, a, a sense of being careful with your resources. Why I'm mentioning sustainability is because this family used to make food every day. And the food was so fresh that literally the vegetables were plucked from the garden every day. And even the meat was farmed. Their own animals were then slaughtered and served on the bed. Now, I know it so so sounds morbid, but even the chicken and, and the fish or whatever you eat is all unfortunately butchered somewhere before it comes to you. In this particular case, it was true farm to fork. It was food that was alive in the morning, served to you in the evening for dinner. And the good thing they did was that they only slaughtered as much or only plucked as much as was needed for that night's dinner. So they were 
hugely in touch with their resources. They grew all their own stuff. It was all organic. They had built a certain, you know, like a like a tea plantation style of farm in the backyard where the, the, the plants were grown in a way where the soil erosion would not happen, where the food would be very, very flavorful, where the animals were only slaughtered for the amount that would be required for, for the next day or for the next uh, 48 hours. And what that really taught me was not just farm to fork, which is a thing we talk about today, and I experienced this in 1993. But what it taught me was that it's very important to be one with your environment. You should have this sense of responsibility. It is our earth at the end of the day. We should stop the wastages that we do. There's so much food being wasted, so much plastic being thrown into the oceans. There's so much that's happening nowadays that is terrible for the environment. And this family really gave me the importance because the whole time that I was there, three days that we stayed there, they spoke about how they, they are taking care of their farms, they're taking care of their local purveyors, they're taking care of the animals, they're making sure that there's no waste and that there is maximum utilization and uh, they're living in harmony with, with, their, with the nature around them. And that's not something we do in urban times and something really, really should focus on. So it's very important to understand this and especially for kids, for the young ones that are watching, it's important that you guys learn to live in harmony with your surroundings from a very early age because if we don't do that, we'll eventually not have a planet worth living in and we would have done that to ourselves. In fact, a very intelligent quote I read, I'm forgetting who wrote it, but they said, it is really strange that the smartest species to ever walk the planet is destroying their only home. Obviously, they're referring to the human beings, right? We're the smartest species that have uh, walked this planet and this is our only home, so let's take care of it. And the second instance I want to talk about is innovation. Now, we're in the food business, guys, and the food business moves at a very quick pace. Literally every three to four months, if you're not going ahead and, you know, innovating, coming up with something new, you'll be left far behind because a lot of people, very talented people, are working very hard. They want to do new things. They want to create new experiences. Consumers, you guys are getting spoiled for choice, right? You have this crazy amount of innovation happening in food and drinks and atmosphere and ambience and music, all aspects of running a restaurant is seeing great innovation. And I think the one sure shot way of failing is ceasing to innovate. Innovation, I think, guys, is the absolute key. If you don't innovate, not just in the food business, in any business, if you don't innovate, if you don't stay a little bit ahead of the curve, don't go too far ahead of the curve because you might not have a business, or rather you might not have a business uh, market available to you. But innovate, be a little bit ahead of the curve, make sure that any new technology that's coming your way, you're either incorporating or you're showcasing. So I think that's one of the key things and this, the part of my life that got this embedded so deeply into my psyche was actually a dinner that I had with my wife. Um, we had just gotten married, uh, this is in 2006 and there was this restaurant called El Bui, that's E-L space B-U-L-L-I. It was the number one restaurant in the world. It was in Spain. We had just gotten married on 30th of uh, June. And on 15th of August, we were supposed to go to Spain. And I chose Spain because I wanted to go to El Bui. But being the lazy bum that I, that I am, I did not book this restaurant. And I didn't realize that the restaurant had a six-month waiting list. So there was no chance I would get this restaurant. But I still wanted to go and check it out. It was the number one restaurant in the world. It, was, it had been the number one restaurant for four years in a row. It was doing something very cool called mo molecular gastronomy that I had no clue what it was, but something that really intrigued me. So I made a few phone calls. I called the maitre d'. The maitre d' literally started laughing at me. He said, sir, this is El Bui, the number one restaurant in the world. You think you can call me 10 days before and get a table? He literally started laughing at me. I got embarrassed. I put the phone down. I, uh, I got embarrassed. I also got a little upset because that's not the way Indian hospitality works, right? You don't laugh at your potential consumer. I called again, and this time I used I tried to use some pull. Now, my father is a very famous man in the food world. But in Barcelona, I don't think anybody would know about him, and, and especially not the number one restaurant in the world. For them, they're the big, big shake. So I tried to convince him. I gave him some information on my father. I said, listen, I'm coming from India, only for a two-day window. I would love it if you can check uh, all your cancellations. And if there is one, give us a table for two. Um, we actually were given a table. I was super excited over the moon that I finally got this restaurant, the hardest restaurant to get in this world, shut for six months, only open for six months, and you have to book a year in advance to be able to get that slot during that time. So we went there. Uh, we did our little trip, but my whole excitement was around this restaurant, and the restaurant just blew my mind. It was literally like a bay, like, you know, one of those pirate cave 
while it coves where you have this tr water body and you have these beautiful mountains and the restaurant was atop a hill an independent big structure huge building and uh, you enter the restaurant it's got bam right in front of you on the right side you have a beautiful kitchen which is lit up like a like a studio like an operating theater white light these wonderfully dressed chefs all working immaculately huge tables food being assembled liquid nitrogen machines and crazy contraptions everywhere all kind of you know g visory happening over there and it blew my mind so when you cross that and you go get to the table i sat down it was a 25 course meal and small small bites one one bite but 25 bites of even small ones are, are big and 25 courses of the most incredible stuff that i've ever seen i mean I had an olive that was based out of a gel. You put the olive in your mouth, it looks like an olive, but when you eat it, it bursts and it's got the taste of olive, but it's not an actually an olive, it's a man-made olive. And the craziness just kept continuing and I immediately started applying this to Indian food because nobody had done it with Indian food at that time in 2006, nobody had done it. And I really got intrigued, I got excited, and that's where the idea of introducing molecular gastronomy to Indian food came to me. So innovation is what I is what I learned on this trip and it became so deeply embedded in my psyche that I realized that if you don't keep changing you will be left far behind. That restaurant now no longer exists, it's become a think tank, they, the, it's a place where they experiment and build new techniques with food um, and just imagine being number one in the world in 2006 and I think they were number one from 2002 down to 2006. Every year they change their menu completely except for the few signature items. So, you know, it's about staying ahead of the curve. It's about constantly innovating, never staying still, and constantly keep moving. And you have to stay ahead of, if you want to stay ahead of the competition, there's one simple mantra, innovate, innovate, and innovate. And now let me talk about responsibility. But I think the one instance that, that I remember the most is when me and my father had gone for an international visit. It was uh, in Europe, in Spain, and uh, we had gone for this culinary meet. I was very young, and my father had asked me and my brother to stay outside. He had gone inside for this conference. While coming out, he was followed by a whole bunch of people. He used to wear, uh, you know, a wonderful immaculate turban. So people in that part of the world, in I think this was in late 80s or maybe early 90s, they had not even seen a turban, so they were very excited to meet him. They thought he's some kind of a Maharaja. He was not a Maharaja, he was just a regular guy who wore a turban, but they found it exciting. While they were walking out towards the car, they were having a conversation, I saw my father getting a little heated, a little peeved, a little irritated with what was going on. And I think when I heard the conversation, I understood why he was getting irritated. And this happened, like I said, in the late 80s somewhere, or maybe the very beginning of the 90s. And the conversation was around Indian food and this other journalist from, from uh, I think it was a big firm, big uh, publication in the, in the UK and my dad who would come from India as the j counter journalist to cover this particular uh, conference, um, they were having this discussion about Indian food and my dad had this deep sense of passion and responsibility towards Indian food. He always thought and he's taught me that it is the greatest cuisine in the world and I completely agree with that and I think eventually the world will agree with that. But the guy was talking about how everything in Indian food is all the same, it's all three basic gravies and all the other dishes are just a potpourri or a mixture of you know, those three basic concepts. And how you eat, and another joke he made was how when you eat food in the UK or Europe uh, with your fingers, there's so much turmeric in the, f in the dishes, in the gravies, that your fingers come out yellow and they remain yellow for four days. My father got really upset about that and he uh, had a fairly vociferous and a fairly heated but gentlemanly argument with the other journalist and my sense of responsibility comes from making people realize the greatness of our cuisine, the fact that it is so incredibly diverse, it's, it's got so much depth, it's got so much philosophy behind it, it's got so much sophistication. I just cannot wait to share it with the rest of the world. And the way to share it with the rest of the world is by opening really good restaurants, by achieving big accolades, by making people realize what we're talking about. And this sense of responsibility is what drives us every day. And I think it's one of those things that is bigger than the business itself. It's bigger than anything. It's, it's about our culture. It's about our great cuisine that has been built by our ancestors lovingly over centuries. So this sense of responsibility is what really guides me and it's what makes us take steps forward in, in putting Indian food on the global palate, making it international and making it achieve the culinary status at the top of the ladder that it deserves. So to sum it all up, first and foremost guys, try and figure out something that you really, really care about. 
something that you feel responsibility towards and something that you would like to be innovative at. The moment you guys can incorporate these three aspects into your career of choice, into your life's pursuit, you will 99% achieve great success. And I think that's the simplicity of it all. We've always been told that if you're passionate about something, you'll achieve great results. Absolutely goes without saying. But get into the things for the right reasons and try and have a bigger cause, not just the pursuit of money or fame. Try and find a bigger cause because that bigger cause will make you work even harder, will get the universe to come behind you. Things will start falling in place and you'll start achieving your goals quicker than you can ever imagine. Always get into the business for the right reasons. Entrepreneurship is like jumping off a cliff and building an aircraft on the way down. It's going to be a tough journey, but you've got to figure it out. You've got to carry on, you've got to bash on regardless. There's, there's always going to be a lot of people that are going to tell you not to get into your own stream. There, there's always going to be a thousand reasons to not do something, but there's always going to be just one good reason to do it. And a true entrepreneur follows that one reason. So if you're an entrepreneur at heart, do not worry about the naysayers. There's always going to be more naysayers till the day that you prove them wrong. Let that be your driving force. Let people say it's impossible. The more you hear the word impossible, the more you should want to make it possible. Steve Jobs said, try and make a dent in the universe. Do something so big that has a big societal impact. And I would urge all of you who are trying to become entrepreneurs that go ahead, take that plunge, jump off that cliff and build that aircraft on the way down. You will achieve great results. Try and search for bigger, bigger ideas, innovate, have a sense of responsibility and find something that you truly, truly care about and try and be the best in the world. <laughs>